Well, I pretty much lost all self-control in April and May, and the result is this video. Hello, beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today I'm here to do a quarter two book haul. So these are all the books that I've bought in April, May, and then so far in June. We still have a couple of weeks left in June, so there could be an opportunity for me to accumulate more books. But for right now, I think this is primarily all that I'm going to haul for quarter two. And the stack has gotten pretty large, so I wanted to go ahead and just get this video out for you. I had a few meh mental health weeks in May. I was just kind of blah. I can't really describe it any better than that. And I was feeling down and discouraged about a few things and I coped by buying books. Now, if you've been here for a while, you know that I typically don't do large book hauls on my channel, and that's because I really want to be mindful and intentional about the books that I bring into my home. And I also realized that there are only so many books that I'm going to be able to read in my lifetime, and that's another reason for my intentionality with book buying. And so I want to make sure that all of the books that I bring into my home, I am genuinely excited to read, and I want to make sure that they are not going to stay on my shelves for a very long period of time, and that I'm just going to lose interest with them. So likely all of the books that I have for you today are books that I'm very, very excited to read. I hope to get to them soon and a lot of them I actually have already read and I just purchased them after reading because I wanted them on my shelves. But there is quite a stack here so we are going to go ahead and just jump right into it. All right so the very first book we'll go ahead and start with is Things We Cannot Say by Kelly Rimmer. This is actually one of the last books that I finished in May. It is a World War II historical fiction set in two perspectives, the present day and then Nazi occupied Poland. I really enjoyed this one. I had never read anything from Kelly Rimmer before. I only picked this up because it was the Bookworm Bitches selection for June and I'm so so thankful that I read this. I think Kelly Rimmer could easily become one of my favorite historical fiction authors just based on this book alone. I very much enjoyed this and I highly recommend if you are looking for another fantastic World War II historical fiction. Next I have this beautiful Chiltern classic edition of Wuthering Heights. I actually picked this one up exclusively to do an ASMR series on my channel where I read chapters of Wuthering Heights in an ASMR whisper voice. I've only done one chapter so far. It's very hard for me to do ASMR videos because I feel like the background noise is too loud for ASMR and I'm only just filming on my my phone. Like I don't have any special equipment that a lot of ASM artists have. And so I've kind of put a pause on this series for now, but I do hope to return to it. And if I never do, I will have this for when I am actually ready to read Wuthering Heights. It was during one of those meh mental health days in May that I decided to go ahead and go to Barnes and Noble and treat myself to some books. I wanted to just have the experience of going into a bookstore and browsing. And I ended up finding a lot of things that I was really interested in, things that I plan to do a video on a little bit later. So I'm not really going to go into too many details about these books or what the video is that I'm going to be filming, but just know that you were likely going to see these in a reading vlog at some point within the next couple of months. First, I have The Things We Leave Unfinished by Rebecca Yaros. I know absolutely nothing about this book, y'all. I just saw it on the table there and I read the synopsis of it and it sounded fantastic. It sounded like it was going to be a very hard hitting romance, which is absolutely what I want to see in my romance books. Also, Rebecca Yaros is a name that is going around right now because she just recently wrote a fantasy book. I think it was her very first fantasy because she typically writes books like this, more romantic contemporary stories. And so I wanted to actually see what she could do in the romance genre before I kind of dive into her fantasy if I was interested in doing so. So I went ahead and picked this up. I also picked up The Fine Print by Lauren Asher. This is another one that has been going around. I've heard a lot of fantastic things about this, primarily from Sid from Sid Bookworm. I'm a part of her Patreon and she just absolutely raved about this story. So this is part of the Dreamland Billionaire series. And from what I understand, I think this follows maybe brothers or something like that. And they are inheriting a Disneyland-like empire. And I think it's following each of their individual stories and their individual romances. This wasn't originally on my radar until I heard such fantastic things about it and Sid is not primarily a romance reader and so when she really loves a romance I want to go ahead and give it a shot. She has loved some of my favorite romances as well so I kind of trust her taste with regard to this and I'm going to go ahead and give it a try. Next I have Be Still My Heart by Emily McIntyre and Sav R. Miller. This seems like it's going to be a bit more romantic suspense and that's what really intrigued me. So it says Skelm Island, Maine has always been known for two things, lobsters and its broken lighthouse but when corpses start showing up in the water the isolated town becomes the face of a cryptic investigation. In this we're following Lincoln Porter, a grumpy ex-seal who has a lobstering business on the island, and then homicide expert Detective Sloan who is called in to assist with the case. She begins digging up skeletons, ones that Lincoln would rather stay buried. Forced to work together, Sloan's suspicious attitude and optimistic demeanor grate on the lobsterman's nerves, resulting in a rivalry that's as addicting as it is volatile. So I just thought this sounded absolutely phenomenal and I wanted to go ahead and give it a shot. These are two authors I have never heard from before. This was there out on the table in Barnes & Noble and I was like, yeah, why not? 
One that I've heard a lot about, it's supposed to be a really great hate to love relationship, The Spanish Love Deception by Elena Armas. I don't really know much about this aside from the fact that it is a hate to love romance and I wanted to go ahead and give it a shot because again, this is one that is going around absolutely everywhere and I'm hearing a lot of really fantastic things about it. And so this is one that's going to be featured in that vlog that I'm going to do at some point in the future and I'm looking forward to see what I think about it. I also decided to pick up Never Never by Colleen Hoover and Taryn Fisher. Y'all know that I'm trash for Colleen Hoover. I want to read everything that she has ever written and I didn't have a copy of this on my shelves. I've actually never read anything from Taryn Fisher so I don't know what her capabilities are as an author but I do know that it's Colleen Hoover and I'm going to read it. I believe this also might be like a romantic mystery suspense. It says Charlize Winwood and Silas Nash have been best friends since they could walk. They've been in love since the age of 14 but as of this morning they are complete strangers. Their first kiss, their first fight, the moment they fell in love, every memory has vanished. Now Charlie and Silas must work together to uncover the truth about what happened to them and why. But the more they learn about the couple they used to be the more they question why they were ever together to begin with. That sounds phenomenal. It doesn't matter what it's about. I'm going to read it. So I was very happy to snag a copy of this at Barnes and Noble. Next, I have The Lonely Hearts Book Club by Lucy Gilmore. So this was a complete impulse purchase. This was out there front and center at Barnes and Noble because it was actually at the time their monthly, I think it was their monthly fiction pick. So it wasn't like a book club pick, but it was a featured fiction selection. It kind of gave me a man called Uva vibes just a tiny bit. I haven't read that story, so I can't speak to the specifics of it, but it does kind of deal like with a grumpy man and kind of a community that's coming together to help him. It says Sloan Parker lives a small contained life as a librarian in her small contained town. She never thinks of herself as lonely, but still she looks forward to that time every day when old curmudgeon Arthur McLaughlin comes to browse the shelves and cheerfully insult her. Their sparring is such a highlight of Sloane's day that when Arthur doesn't show up one morning, she's instantly concerned and then another day passes and another. Anxious, Sloane tracks the old man down only to discover him all but bedridden and desperately struggling to hide how happy he is to see her. Wanting to bring more cheer into Arthur's gloomy life, Sloane creates an impromptu book club. Slowly, the lonely misfits of their sleepy town begin to find one another and in their book club, they find the joy of unlikely friendship because as it turns out everyone has a special book in their heart and a reason to get lost and eventually found within the pages. So this sounds like it's going to be a love story to books. It sounds like it's going to be a very much a found family type situation and you're going to have this old man who has a lot of joy brought into his life by Sloan and the people of the community and I just thought this sounded fantastic. It sounded like it was going to warm my cold dead heart and so that's why I went ahead and picked it up. As y'all know I am part of a monthly Facebook gifting group where every single month we post our wish list and then somebody gifts us a book and we give somebody else a book in return. And for the month of May, I was very excited to receive The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot by Marianne Cronin. I have heard some phenomenal things about this one, and this just sounds like it's going to be another heartwarming, touching, but possibly devastating story. From what I understand, this follows two people, Lenny and Margot. I think they are both in hospice care, but Lenny is only 17 and Margot is 83, and together their total combined years equal 100. And I think it's just about the solid friendship and relationship that the two build together. It says, as their friendship blooms, a world of stories opens up for these unlikely companions who between them have been alive for 100 years. Though their days are dwindling, both are determined to leave their mark on the world. With the help of Lenny's doting palliative care nurse and Father Arthur, the hospital's patient chaplain, Lenny and Margot devise a plan to create 100 paintings showcasing the stories of the century they have lived. Stories of love and loss, of courage and kindness, of unexpected tenderness and pure joy. Y'all, I'm kind of getting a little bit teary just reading that synopsis, so I think that this is going to absolutely devastate me. This came in from my library and I was like, I can't handle reading this right now because I'm about to go on vacation and I need some light summer fluffy reads. I cannot be an emotional mess on a cruise in the middle of the Caribbean. So I'm very excited to get to this one because I think it's going to be that gut punch that I always look for in my books, but I know that this is probably going to make me cry and I'm here for it. I did take an impromptu trip to Second and Charles. I can't remember whether it was in April or May, but we needed to head out to where it is anyway. It's about an hour away from us, so we don't go there too terribly often. I brought a bunch of books there that hadn't sold on Pango, and so I was like, what the heck, let me go, turn these in, and I'll see if I can find anything. And I came away with a handful of things. The first that I have here is The Haunting of Ashburn House by Darcy Coates. They actually had quite a lot of Darcy Coates at Second and Charles and she is on my radar because again in Sid Bookworm's Patreon everybody absolutely loves Darcy Coates and they rave about her and so I wanted to go ahead and give her a shot. I actually did finish this just a few days ago so it will be featured in my June wrap-up at the end of the month but this basically features our main character Adrian, and she inherits Ashburn House from a great aunt she didn't even know existed and naturally she gets there and some very weird and creepy and sinister things start to happen and it's following that story. The vibes in here were fantastic. I ended up really enjoying this one overall and I would be certainly willing to read more from Darcy Coates in the future. I also picked up the next two books in the Stephanie Plum series. So I have Lean Mean 13 and Fearless 14. I am so very far behind in this series y'all. I think at this point there's like 30 books in the Stephanie Plum series. If you're not familiar Stephanie Plum is kind of an accidental bounty hunter and every single book follows the shenanigans that she gets into in her role as a bounty hunter and there are a lot of quirky and fantastic characters in these stories. 
these are just a good time. They are fun, funny, and fast. And I like to go to them whenever I kind of need a palette cleanser. This is not a series that I'm in a hurry to finish. So if it takes me the rest of my life to even make progress in it, I'm not too terribly upset about it. And let's be honest, a lot of them are very much the same. They kind of follow the same structure and they're not overtly memorable. So I'm not really going to rate these any more than a three stars. They're not going to be anything that stick in my mind, but they're just a good time. And I don't think I'm really willing to give up on the series just yet. So I still need to read 12 and now I have 13 and 14. And the reason why I did this is because Second and Charles always have an abundance of Janet Ivanovich novels in hardcovers and I can typically get them in pretty decent condition. And that's why I wanted to go ahead and just pick up the next two. I could have picked up a lot more than this, but I didn't because I didn't know how long it was going to take me just to read these ones. So I have these for when I'm ready to continue with the series. I also managed to snag a Diane Chamberlain at Second and Charles, which I was excited about. The Stolen Marriage. Y'all know that I absolutely love Diane Chamberlain. She's quickly becoming one of my favorite authors in auto buy just because I feel like she crafts such a wonderful story. This looks like it's set at least in one perspective in 1944. Pregnant, alone, and riddled with guilt, 23-year-old Tess DeMello abruptly gives up her budding career as a nurse and ends her engagement to the love of her life, unable to live a lie. Instead, she turns to the baby's father for help and agrees to marry him, moving to the small rural town of Hickory, North Carolina. Tess's new husband, Henry Kraft, is a secretive man who often stays out all night, hides money from his new wife, and shows her no affection. Tess quickly realizes she's trapped in a strange and loveless marriage with no way out. The people of Hickory admire and respect Henry, but see Tess as an outsider, treating her with suspicion and disdain. When one of the town's golden girls dies in a terrible accident, everyone holds Tess responsible. Henry keeps his secrets even closer now, though it seems that everyone knows something about him that Tess does not. When a sudden polio epidemic strikes Hickory, the townspeople band together to build a hospital. Tess knows she is needed and defies Henry's wishes to begin working there. Through this work, she begins to find purpose and meaning, yet at home, Henry's actions grow more alarming by the day. As Tess works to save the lives of her patients, can she untangle the truth behind her husband's mysterious behavior and find the love and the life she was meant to have? So of course, that sounds absolutely phenomenal. I feel like Diane Chamberlain has a really wide array of capabilities. So a couple of the books that I've read from her have been historical, but told in present and past perspectives. This is told in an entirely historical timeline in 1944. And then the one that I most recently read was set in the present day and in the 90s, but it was like a mystery. It was not a historical fiction overall. It was more of a mystery than anything else. So I'm really excited to see what she can do with the story. I will probably read everything that she puts out going forward. And then the final books I picked up at Second and Charles are the last two books that I need for Sue Grafton's Alphabet Murders. X and Y is for yesterday. I have been reading this series following private investigator Kinsey Milhone since I was a teenager. This is another series that I've just been really taking my time with and really enjoying overall. If you're not familiar, Sue Grafton actually passed away before she can complete the final book in this series, Z. So it will end at Y. I will never get a conclusion to Kinsey's story, but that is totally fine. I will absolutely finish X and Y and be done with the series. But this is another one that I'm not really in a hurry to complete because I know that once I'm done, I'm done. And there's a finality to that and a little bit of a sadness to that. So I will hang on to these and read them when I'm ready to read them. And then perhaps my biggest impulse was a really big order that I made on Book Outlet. It had been several months since I purchased anything from Book Outlet and they had quite a few things on there that I actually really wanted. And so I went ahead and pushed purchase. So I have several books here to talk to you about today. The first one that I have is The Last Thing to Burn by Will Dean. So I recently read The Firstborn by Will Dean. It was a book of the month selection and I had never heard of him before and I wanted to give it a try. And I was super impressed by that story. There were a couple of really big twists in there that I didn't see coming and I thought it was overall really well crafted. And it really made me interested in Will Dean's backlist and then anything he publishes in the future. I have no idea what this is about. On an isolated farm in the United Kingdom, a woman is trapped by the monster who kidnapped her seven years ago. When she discovers she is pregnant, she resolves to protect her child no matter the cost and starts to meticulously plan her escape. But when another woman is brought into the fold, everything changes. New questions must be asked. Can she save herself, her child, and this innocent woman at the same time? Or must she sacrifice the woman to save her baby? Is she doomed to remain a captive for the rest of her life? All right, I'm here for it. It's not very long, so I imagine this is going to be very quick paced, which is not always my thing because I like the more deep character dives, but I'm certainly going to give this a shot. I also ended up grabbing The King of Crows by Libba Bray. I actually recently read this and finished the Diviner's Quartet series, and so I was really excited to see this on Book Outlet because it meant I could just purchase it at a really decent price and I could go ahead and complete this series. So this one is going straight onto my bookshelves. I also picked up The Family Remains by Lisa Jewell. Y'all know how much I really, really enjoy Lisa Jewell. She is certainly becoming an auto buy mystery suspense thriller author. This is kind of the sequel to The Family Upstairs, so I don't really want to say much about this, but the first book kind of follows a really cultish like situation and it was interesting. It wasn't my favorite Lisa Jewel by far, but I certainly want to continue and kind of see how it ends up. So I was glad to see this on Book Outlet and snagged it up. Another one that I picked up, The Violin Conspiracy by Brendan Slocum. So I actually picked this up because Brendan has a new release that has already come out or is coming out this year. And it sounded like it covered topics that I'd never really read about before. It seems like his books primarily focus on 
music or classical music in some form. And so before I tried to get his new release, I thought I might give his backlist title a try. So this says, growing up black in rural North Carolina, Ray McMillian's life is already mapped out. If he's lucky, he'll get a job at the hospital cafeteria. If he's extra lucky, he'll earn more than minimum wage. But Ray has a gift and a dream. He's determined to become a world-class professional violinist and nothing will stand in his way. Not his mother who wants him to stop making such a racket, not the fact that he can't afford a violin suitable to his talents, not even the racism inherent in the world of classical music. When he discovers that his great-great-grandfather's beat-up old fiddle is actually a priceless Stradivarius, all his dreams suddenly seem within reach. Together, Ray and his violin take the world by storm, but on the eve of the renowned and cutthroat Tchaikovsky competition, the Olympics of classical music, the violin is stolen. A ransom note for $5 million left in its place. Ray will have to piece together the clues to recover his treasured Strad before it's too late. With the descendants of the man who once enslaved Ray's great-great-grandfather asserting that the instrument is rightfully theirs, and with his family staking their own claim, Ray doesn't even know who he can trust or whether he will ever see his beloved violin again. So this sounds absolutely phenomenal. I'm excited to go ahead and give this a try and see what this author can do. And if I love it, I will certainly be reading his new release. I also picked up one of the newer B.A. Paris novels, The Prisoner. I really know nothing about what this one's about. I don't really need to. I find a lot of enjoyment in B.A. Paris's stories overall, but for some reason they're never highly rated. Like her books are always the lowest rated on my TBR. And I'm not really sure why that is, but I think I'm going to keep continuing with her because she doesn't really disappoint me. There was only one book that I have not really liked all that much, but all the other ones I've had a really solid reading experience with. So I grabbed this one. I also picked up The Invisible Husband of Frick Island by Colleen Oakley. So this is an example of something I don't normally do. I already have a Colleen Oakley and it's on my TBR for 2023 because I want to try her as an author to see if I will like her. So I normally don't intentionally buy additional books by authors that I haven't read. You know, I want to try the author first before I buy more of their books because if I don't like the author, I'm just going to end up unhauling all of their works. But I'm truly intrigued by Colleen Oakley. I think the synopses of her books sound absolutely unique and remarkable and I've heard great things about her as an author. So I wanted to go ahead and pick this up. This definitely sounds really interesting. So this follows Piper Parrish's life on Frick Island and everything is perfect except for one pesky detail. Her beloved husband, Tom, is dead. When Tom's crab boat capsized and his body wasn't recovered, Piper rocked to the core, did a most peculiar thing, carried on as if her husband were not only still alive, but right there beside her. She cooked him breakfast, walked him to the docks each morning, and met him for their standard weekly dinner date at the One-Eyed Crab. And what were the townspeople to do but go along with their wonderful widowed Piper? Andrus Caldwell's career is not going well. An ambitious young journalist, he'd hoped to be a national award-winning podcaster by now rather than writing fluff pieces for a small town newspaper. But when he gets an assignment to travel to remote Frick Island and cover their boring annual cakewalk fundraiser, he stumbles upon a much more fascinating tale. An entire town pretending to see and interact with a man who does not actually exist. Convinced it's the career-making story he needs for his podcast, Anders returns to the island to begin covert research and spend more time with the enigmatic Piper. But he has no idea that out of all the lives he's about to upend, it's his that will change the most. So that just sounds so sweet. There might be like a budding romance between Piper and this reporter and I'm absolutely here for it. I'm charmed just by the synopsis of this and I'm excited to get to it. I also picked up a Kristen Hanna, Homefront. Don't know anything about this. I just know that it's going to be harrowing and heartbreaking as all Kristen Hanna books are. As you can probably tell from the title and the yellow ribbon and the helicopter here, there's definitely going to be military aspects to it. And I know it's just going to like probably rip me into pieces and I'm okay with that. I was also very excited to see that book outlet had some of these seasons classic editions. I love these editions so much. They are definitely some of my favorite, but they were extremely limited edition. I don't think they're publishing any more in these editions. And some of them I'm just not going to be able to get because they're so expensive at this point. But when I saw these three, I wanted to go ahead and grab them. First, I have Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. I know it's going to be kind of hard to see, but that is the cover, spine, and the back. I think this is the only other Jane Austen that I haven't actually read before. So I'm glad that I was able to get this one. I also snagged Emma. This is actually one that I read this year already, and I already have the Chiltern edition in this, but I wanted to have it in this edition as well. So I was glad to see they had that on Book Outlet. And the final one I grabbed, End of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. So I've actually never read End of Green Gables, but this seems to be like one of the more popular classic kind of middle grade children's books. And so I knew if I was ever going to read it, it had to be in this edition. So I snagged it up. This is definitely one of their like fall seasonal editions, as you can tell by the covers, the brown and the orange. And I'm certainly glad to have this one as well. I also picked up two Kristen Harmels that were on there, The Forest of Vanishing Stars and The Book of Lost Names. Kristen Harmel is a pretty popular historical fiction author. I have read one other book by hers called The Room on Rue Amelie, I believe, and I really enjoyed that one. And so I want to go ahead and read more from her. She also has a new release coming out this year that I will definitely grab if I enjoy these ones as well. So I went ahead and snagged these ones on Book Outlet. Book Outlet was just the place to be for historical fiction in general because I also snagged The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. This is one of her newest releases and I am so excited to read this one. I absolutely loved The Alice Network by her and I think I will probably read any historical fiction that she writes. I don't really even need to know 
know what it's about. It says, wry and bookish history student Mila Pavlichenko organizes her life around her library job and her young son, but Hitler's invasion of Russia sends her on a different path. Given a rifle and sent to join the fight, Mila must transform herself from studious girl to deadly sniper. Okay. A lethal hunter of Nazis known as Lady Death. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm not going to read anything more about that. We have a female sniper called Lady Death who I think is killing Nazis, so count me in. I am hyped for this one. I'm also hyped for The Nature of Fragile Things by Susan Meisner. I've read two or three other books of her so far and I've loved them both. I think she's a masterful storyteller and I will absolutely be getting to this one as soon as I possibly can. I also ended up grabbing The Exiles by Jane Harper. This is her newest release and it is the third book in her Detective Aaron Falk series. I'm not necessarily in love with the series but I enjoy them enough and so I was going to go ahead and continue. I don't know if this is the final book in that series or if she's going to be continuing. I do know that this will catch me up in the series and so I'm happy to have this so that I can get to it eventually. I was also hyped to see False Witness by Karen Slaughter on there. This is a hardcover and I believe it's one of her standalones. It's definitely one that I have not read yet and y'all know that I'm such a fangirl of Karen Slaughter. Lee Collier has worked hard to build what looks like a normal life. She's an up-and-coming defense attorney at a prestigious law firm in Atlanta, would do anything for her 16-year-old daughter Maddie, and is managing to successfully co-parent through a pandemic after an amicable separation from her husband Walter. All right, so it sounds like COVID might get some page time in here. But Lee's ordinary life masks a childhood no one should have to endure a childhood tarnished by secrets, broken by betrayal, and ultimately destroyed by a brutal act of violence. On a Sunday night at her daughter's school play, she gets a call from one of the firm's partners who wants Lee to come on board to defend a wealthy man accused of multiple counts of rape. Though wary of the case, it becomes apparent she doesn't have much choice if she wants to keep her job. When she meets the accused face to face, she realizes that it's no coincidence that he's specifically asked for her to represent him. She knows him and he knows her. More to the point, he may know what happened over 20 years ago and why Lee has spent two decades avoiding her past. Okay. Suddenly, she has a lot more to lose than this case. The only person who can help is her younger estranged sister Callie, the last person Lee would ever want to drag into this after all they've been through. But with the life-shattering truth in danger of being revealed, she has no choice. Oh my gosh, this sounds absolutely phenomenal. And as usual, there's going to be a complicated sister dynamic in here. That is a common theme through a lot of Karen Slaughter's books, especially her standalones. And so I'm really, really excited to be able to get to this one at some point. I just love Karen Slaughter so much. She is the queen of dark, gritty, gruesome suspense thrillers. I think that this one's going to be no different and I am very very much looking forward to this one. Y'all, it is hot in here. Ooh, my hair's down. These lights are on me. I am sweating, not to give you TMI or anything. These next few, I'm going to run through really quickly because they are all books that I listened to over the past couple of months, and I ended up loving them so much I wanted them on my shelves. So I purchased them, but I have already gone ahead and thoroughly reviewed them on my channel. So I will try to remember to link those wrap-ups down below for you if you are interested. The first that I have here is Skyward by Brandon Sanderson. This is a young adult sci-fi novel that I enjoyed immensely, even more than I thought that I was going to, and I'm excited to continue with this one. Star of Hearts by Jennifer Hillier. She is another fantastic thriller suspense author. I read this one a couple of months ago and really enjoyed this one as well. I know that this is one by her that gets a lot of attention and a lot of hype and I think it was well deserved overall. So this is one that I recommend starting with if you have never actually read a Jennifer Hillier. This is a good one to get going with. Of course I also picked up The Silent Sister by Diane Chamberlain. This was the one that I mentioned earlier that was more of a mystery than anything. There was a slightly historical perspective in 1990 but it wasn't a historical fiction. Really enjoyed this one. Thought it was very very strong. It was fast-paced, compulsively readable, and like I said, I just love Diane Chamberlain and think she is fantastic at crafting a story. Dark Corners of the Night by Meg Gardner. This is the third in her Unsub series. It follows a member of the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit as they are trying to catch serial killers. I thought that this was going to be the third and final book in that series, but it's not. There's at least one more coming out, so I will probably continue it until its completion, but I was glad to go ahead and read this and get caught up in the series. I also picked up Before We Were Yours by Lisa Wingate. This was my very first Lisa Wingate. It certainly will not be my last. I absolutely enjoyed my reading experience of this one. This was a fictional story that was based on real life happenings of Georgia Tan who had an illegal baby brokering business where she would essentially steal babies and adopt them out to people who could not have babies and she would make a ton of money on this. And this was just absolutely harrowing, poignant, heartbreaking. I had a great time reading this as much as you can have a great time reading a story like this and I am certainly going to be reading more from Lisa Wingate in the future. I also ended up picking up Cress because I did read this. This is the third book in the Lunar Chronicles Quartet by Marissa Meyer. It is a young adult sci-fi series. I really enjoyed this one. This is my favorite of the series so far and I only have one more to go. I hope to be finishing it this year, but even if I don't, I'm glad to be one step further in that series. Next, I have Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. This was the final book that I ended up selecting for my authentic book box subscription. I ended up canceling that subscription for the time being just because I found a lot of the items in the boxes very, very repetitive, but I'm still looking forward to getting to this one. This is sounding like it's going to be a family drama primarily following siblings and I've heard great things about Anne Napolitano as an author and so I'm excited to still be able to get to this. I also have a likely story by Lee 
McMullen Abramson. I couldn't remember her full name. This is actually the final book that I selected for my Aardvark Book Club box subscription. I ultimately ended up canceling that one as well just because I wasn't in love with their selections every single month and it seemed like when I was picking one I wasn't super excited about the choices but this one actually was the first one that I selected that really sounded right up my alley. For Isabel Manning growing up as the daughter of New York's intellectual it couple was both a blessing and a curse. Her elegant mother Claire had a reputation as a whip smart society hostess while Isabel's father the incomparable Ward Manning was the king of the New York Times bestseller list. Having to share Ward with his adoring public wasn't always easy but at home Claire ensured that Isabel's childhood was filled with magic and love. All Isabel ever wanted as an adult in a career like her father's but after many false starts and wrecked by grief after Claire's unexpected death Isabel faces down her 35th birthday alone without a book deal without her mom and on the brink of a messy breakdown. When Isabel discovers some shocking truths about her parents she wonders if the world's rosy image of her famous family was all a lie. Isabel's unfolding drama is punctuated with fragments of a clever book within a book where a righteous female narrator steals back the spotlight from an unscrupulous male artist. The characters seem eerily familiar but are any of the story's plot points rooted in fact and more mysterious who is the author. Not really sure how I feel about the book in a book situation but I'm absolutely going to be giving this one a shot. Then I have my book of the month selections for April and May. I ultimately ended up skipping June. June had some amazing releases coming out and book of the month just completely missed the mark on the selections that they put up. I ultimately ended up skipping June because I just was so disappointed in their selections but I do have April's pick here. The Only Survivors by Megan Miranda. This kind of sounds like it might be a slight stab at dark academia although I believe it follows a crime that happened in a high school and not in a college so we're gonna see. I have a hit or miss relationship with Megan Miranda. Her books usually don't blow me out of the water but they provide a very solid reading experience. I was at least really excited to see this as a selection on book of the month and so I jumped at the chance to grab it. I will say that May's selections for book of the month were on point and I wanted so many of them. Of course I had to grab The Last Word by Taylor Adams. Y'all know how I feel about No Exit. It's one of my favorite suspense thrillers of all time and I'm very much looking forward to this which I do believe also kind of has an isolated setting not maybe wintry isolation but isolated nonetheless. This follows Emma Carpenter who lives in isolation with her golden retriever Leica house sitting an old beachfront home on the rainy Washington coast. Her only human contact is with her enigmatic elderly neighbor Deke and via text with the house's owner Jules. One day she reads a poorly written but gruesome horror novel by the author H.G. Kane and posts a one-star review that drags her into an online argument with none other than the author himself. Soon after disturbing incidents start to occur at night. To Emma this can't just be a coincidence. It was strange enough for this author to bigger with her online about a lousy review. Could he be stalking her too? I'm not going to read any more than that. I am here for it. It's Taylor Adams. I'm probably going to read everything that he writes. I didn't love Hairpin Bridge nearly as much as I loved No Exit but I loved it on its own merits and I thought it was a pretty unique story overall so I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does in this one. Another one that I was crazy hyped to see as a selection for May, Yours Truly by Abby Jimenez. I read Part of Your World earlier this year and it is still one of my favorite books of 2023 and probably one of my favorite romances of all time. This book follows the best friend of the main character from that story and I'm excited to see what her love story is going to be. I'm pretty sure this starts out as a hate to love and then they kind of get to know each other and things start to progress. If this is anything like part of your world there are definitely going to be some harder hitting elements, some hard conversations, some deep topics that are covered in here and I am 100% here for it. Now I have heard that there is some miscommunication in here. People who loved part of your world didn't love this nearly as much which makes me a little bit cautious, a little bit trepidatious and I've heard that miscommunication is the trope that's in here so I hope it's not too big of a deal but we're gonna see. I'm gonna reserve judgment until I actually read the story and see for myself but if I love this even close to the amount that I loved part of your world Abby Jimenez will instantly become an auto by author for me. And then the last book of the month book I have The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer. So I was really intrigued by the premise of this because it follows a death doula. So Clover has decided to dedicate her life to kind of helping people who are in hospice and who are dying and I think that takes a special kind of person and I know that this is going to dive heavily into grief but it's also going to follow Clover herself as she's trying to figure out what she wants for her life and as she tries to figure out how to really live and I think that's just going to be extremely beautiful. It sounds like it's going to be a deep character study which is what I absolutely love and so I think that this is going to be right up my alley. I haven't heard anybody talk about this story so I have no idea what to expect going in. I haven't read any reviews about it or anything like that so I'm going in kind of blind but I think that it's going to be a wonderful story. I also ended up grabbing the Waterstones special edition of It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover. I just thought that this was absolutely stunning. I loved the sprayed edges. This is a Colleen Hoover that deals with domestic abuse and I know that this is consistently a lot of people's favorite Colleen Hoovers but oddly enough it wasn't mine. I didn't think this was nearly as strong as some of her books like Regretting You or reminders of him but it was still a very important story to tell and I do have It Starts With Us which is kind of the sequel to this on my TBR so I will absolutely be reading that at some point because I did love Atlas and that story follows Atlas and he was not nearly as prominent in this story 
favorite as I would have liked it to be. So we're gonna see if I actually like it starts with us better than I liked it ends with us. But either way, I have this beautiful addition. I just love the white and the pink and the gold writing and of course those sprayed edges. I just think that this was absolutely beautiful. So I went ahead and picked it up. All right, y'all, we are finally getting to the end. All that I have left are the special edition fairy loots that I got in April and May's adult book only box, as well as some non-subscription related special editions that I ordered. So April's adult book only box was The Foxglove King by Hannah Witten. This is another fantasy story that is getting a lot of hype. I've heard a lot of great things about. So I was excited to see it as part of the Fairy Loot monthly box. It is a gorgeous edition. Look at those sprayed edges, y'all. Like, look at those beautiful, beautiful sprayed edges. And the naked hardcover is just beyond stunning. Fairy Loot continues to kill it with these special editions. I also have The Curse of Saints by Kate Dramas. This is one that I had never heard of before I received it in the box. And I'm a little bit wary because the synopsis of this was very, very vague, but I'm still going to give it a shot. It's got some ombre sprayed edges and again the naked hardcover on this is beautiful way more beautiful than the actual dust jacket look at that stunning and then there's the end pages right there so like I said don't know too terribly much about this one but when I have the ability to sit down and read it I will know I'm really far behind on these fairy loot books just because I was reading way of kings for so long and now I'm reading house of sky and breath and that's going to take me a minute too but as soon as I finish with that I plan on diving into some of these fairy loot books and then the final two books that I have here I actually did a separate video completely dedicated to the unboxing of these books so you might have already seen it but I have the fairy loot editions of house of earth and blood I'm just in love with these covers there's just something so pleasing about these covers. They just seem so sophisticated, but yet they scream high epic fantasy to me. I don't know. They're just, they're just gorgeous. You have these. You have Danica and Bryce on the front end pages, Hunt and Rune on the back. These are the gorgeous sprayed edges. We have our girl Bryce here. There's the spine. And there's the back, Through Love All Is Possible, which I absolutely love. I just love that so much. And then of course we have House of Sky and Breath, equally as stunning, just love this so much. There's the spine, there's the back, light it up. That is like probably my favorite quote from this whole book. It's so simple, but if you've read this book and where Bryce is making the drop, oh my gosh, I just get chills thinking about that light it up moment. Here we have Hunt and Bryce. I think this is probably my favorite rendition of Bryce that I have seen. I just think this is, captures her so amazingly. Fierce, curvy, ferocious, I just love it. And of course she's a redhead, so I approve. And then we have Therian on the back here, but I'm not 100% sure who this is. I think this might be Cormac. Again, I haven't finished this story, so I'm not all the way into it, but Cormac is a prominent player. I'm not gonna say who he is because it would be spoilers for this book, but I think that's who this is. Then of course, Hunt here on the cover, the sprayed edges, and then light it up on the back. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I've hauled in April, May, and part of June. That was a lot. That was probably the most books that I've hauled in quite a while. So I have a lot of work that I have to do in order to read through these. And I'm just a mess, y'all. My hair is all over the place. It's really chaos here as we're trying to get ready to go on our cruise, which we're leaving for today. So I have to wrap this up, but I hope that you enjoyed. Please comment down below and let me know some of the books that you have hauled recently and the ones that you are most excited for. Or let's go ahead and have you leave me a ghost emoji in honor of The Haunting of Ashburn House by Dar Darcy Coates. That's one of the books that I hauled. Go ahead and leave me a ghost if you made it to the end of this video. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I could do. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.